Yo, we live? What's up? I'm Keith Kalfis, and I just want to make sure we have good audio because I want to talk about some stuff that changed my life, and hopefully, man, hopefully this can create some value for you. It's about who, not how. I just got my phone right here because I'm on eight different platforms at once, you know, Facebook, YouTube, um, LinkedIn. And so who, not how. If you keep asking yourself, how can I do this? How am I going to do that? If I already have all these things going on, how am I going to take on more? Right? Because you want to be like successful. Are we live? What's up? I'm Keith Kelfis. Oh, that sounds good. So you want to be successful. And I don't know where this came from, this brainwashing that has always got us, getting us ask, how am I going to do this? Well, how am I going to do that? Man, how do those people do that? <laughs> well, I read this book recently by Dan Sullivan. He's the strategic coach. You can go on Audible. You can go, you just go on a binge and listen to this guy for weeks. He's like 75 years old now. And he's coached all types of businesses, thousands of businesses. He's coached broke people, millionaires, probably even a few, few billionaires. And, um, and one of his many books that I read, he got he has this book called Who, Not How. And I attended in Tennessee a few years ago this thing. I don't know if I could talk about it publicly, but it's a mastermind, a business mastermind with some of the people in our industry that behind the scenes they get together and they pay money and then they go coach each other. Uh, well, they're, they're, they're coach. It's a mastermind group, right? And this thing costs a lot of money to get into. And I attended it for one year. And I was not surprised to see that the biggest, uh, the theme of the event was who, not how. And then one of the rules was you're not allowed to talk about anything that you're not actually doing. If you're talking about theory, then you can't talk about it in the group. You have to talk about things that you're actually doing. Another good pronunciation there. So I'll get into the meat and potatoes of this. I see some of you guys joining in here. What up, though? Uh, I feel when I feel there's more than I can handle, I ask the Lord to guide me through. That's a great thing to do. I like that. And I will answer your questions. All right. Start asking who are the who's, not the how's. Even if there's a book, if, if you, uh, the answers that you need to everything, if you can't find a real living person in real life that can help you, well, you can if you pay them, because I believe in the future in 2022 and moving forward, and, and it has been like this for a while, but trying to get the answers to the questions you want for free on social media or on, or on YouTube, you can find a lot of answers, but the really, really good stuff that's going to help you is either going to come from paying for online courses or experiential, paying for an actual court coach or joining a private group that costs you actual money or paying for some type of transformation by flying out somewhere like at, at the higher levels people are they're peeling off some cheese to get the answers they want they they're throwing money at problems to compress time so if you i don't know what you you, you i don't know where you're at but maybe you could pay someone 100 bucks maybe you could there's people who pay people 50 60 thousand dollars to get private coaching you're like what you know, there's people that pay a thousand dollars an hour. There's people that charge a thousand dollars for a half an hour. I know a guy who charges one thousand seven hundred and forty three dollars for 12 minutes just to talk to him. You might think that's insane, but there are people that have the knowledge, wisdom and experience. The who's I'm not saying how. You say, you ask yourself, who has the I'm trying to take a big topic and compress it down. Listen to me. This is quantum. This is like fascinating. There are people that have already achieved what you want or are very highly developed consciously that you could talk to. I'm not playing for like a one 10 minute, 10 minute conversation, and they can get you into a space where you have some big sticking point or you're stuck. And just the texture of the conversation and the questions that they ask can make you, you know, you'd feel uncomfortable or, or whatever. 
and get you over that hump to where boom now it's behind you and now literally like i literally was on the phone on a coaching call somebody coaching me because i coach people on monday nights and i pay people to coach me i was on the phone with a coach a couple weeks ago and this coach said one thing to me that i had been stuck on for two years and just the way he described it and explained it I, I literally almost started doing backflips. I, I got excited all over again because he was able to put the pieces of the puzzle together because somebody who's standing on the outside of you, the who, you stop asking how and you say who can help me with this. Um, now, if you can't afford it money-wise, it's in books. So you say who, not how. Who has the experience that wrote the book that can give me the answers that I need? So instead of following a bunch of random stuff on YouTube and watching this law of attraction, abundance, and falling asleep to self frequencies and watching documentaries about higher ascension aliens, I've done all that stuff. It's fun. What if you got books that are hyper-specific around the topic of specifically of what you're trying to learn about? Ooh, does that make you feel uncomfortable? So who wrote the book that if you're trying to get your finances to the next level, organize your finances, bookkeeping, accounting, books and courses, private coaching or groups, you know, all that stuff. If you're trying to get your sales dialed in, who's really good in your industry? Grant Cardone is great. But what if you do like landscaping, window cleaning, soft washing, pressure washing? Who is within your industry who's an absolute pro who has dominated sales and maybe they put together some type of curriculum or they can coach you or you can pay them hey you know hit them up on facebook like bro you you crush it in sales and i know you're really busy when you get some downtime i'll pay you 1500 bucks if you just spend a couple nights with me on zoom and walk me through a sales pro i'll pay you 25 i'll pay you five thousand dollars if you help me get my sales dialed in Ah, now that person can go take, you know, like 10 years of knowledge, wisdom and experience in an entire sales process if they're willing to share it with you. If you're a good student and they might help you plug something into your business that make your sales go like you could double your business in 12 months just by plugging into the right source. So you stop asking, how am I going to make more money? How? And say, who can coach me? Literally. 30 minutes ago, before I hopped on live, I hit a, a friend on Voxer who has a million dollar business and it's com it's like pretty much automated. And I was like, bro, you do this one thing in your business that's really impressive to me. And I think you're the who you're the dude. Maybe we can do some type of value exchange or I can pay you for coaching, but I'm having a sticking point and I want to know your thoughts. You know, he messaged me back on Voxer. He goes like, bro. Let's have an explore. Uh, it's called an exploratory call or something where you talk to see if it's a good fit. And then we set up some type of thing. Dude, I'll pay him a thousand bucks. I'll pay him whatever if you could help me over this sticking point because it'll only make you money. So what you're doing is you're investing in yourself. You're investing back into yourself. You're taking your bets and you're betting it on yourself instead of buying some, you know, monster truck tires for your truck so you can look cool. So that nobody cares, right? Or going out and buying a crotch rocket or something. What if you took that money and you invested it back into your education? Like I, I'm, I'm obsessed with this type of stuff. I'm not saying I have all the answers. This is what I'm learning, bro. Uh, there's a private membership coaching group. It's $5,000 to get in. I literally just joined this a week and a half ago. And it's an accountability coaching group to hold me accountable to what I said I'm going to do. And it's like, I'm so excited about this because you might have all the information in the world, but do you have the who's that are going to hold you accountable to make sure you do that stuff? Are you part of a, an, an association of people who care about you and about your success, your success? So I think about stuff like that. What is this? Uh, let's get to some of the comments here.
Oh, what's up? What up, dog? I was just thinking about you, bro. Matt Thibault. Did I say it right? Or Thibault? Check that dude out on Facebook. He's got a marketing agency. He like literally has a bunch of... The guy I got on the screen right now. Remember that dude? Look him up on Facebook. He's got a marketing agency and he gives these f totally free videos about tips on how to market your business. And it's not like just some stupid stuff. Like it's like... I literally got it like bookmarked and he doesn't even know this, but I'm going to go back this winter and I'm going to be taking extensive notes because there's a lot of low hanging fruit and things. So he's the who, right? Back to what I said, who, not how. Stop asking, how can I get my sales better and go find somebody who is an expert and obsessed with it and then go learn some stuff from them and they can help you identify a bunch of low hanging fruit. Basically what I mean is a bunch of stuff that's right in front of you that you can just reach out and grab it. And yet you didn't see it, but it took somebody to help you identify it, to just remove the distraction away. What's up, dog? Austin Douglas, good evening. That's powerful. At the end of the day, by yourself, you have to learn how to defeat your inner demons that are trying to take you off your mission. That's not just some words you type through. That is very, very, that's deep and that's serious. Um, I'm not trying to push my beliefs on you, but this little mini Bible here, I was reading this. There's a saying in here, um, hold all thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. So if you're being lazy and you just can't get your act together because you can't get your mind together and you're just, you know, drifting, so to speak. There's this interesting thing happens when you grow up and you become an adult and, you know, you don't have to get up and go to school. You don't have to, you got to get up and go to work, or, you know, or unless you have a bunch of passive income flowing in. But this interesting ha thing happens where, you can actually drift in America and still get by. And if you don't have anything pushing you, the only thing that will push you is fear, fear of loss or losing what you have. There are certain times in my life where, I, I don't know, something will bump up in against my space and my reality. And it's something that could potentially be Something that could, you know, threaten my bottom line or my business or, or I'll see something will happen in someone else's life or business. I was like, whoa, OK, man, we, we got to uh, sort of guard the fortress. We have to work hard. We have to stay focused because I don't want that to happen. Like, that's why we have a budget or that's why we, you know, save money or whatever. Like, or that's why you save money for a rainy day. And it'll instill a little bit of fear in you to make, make you like put a fire under your tail and make you start running hard again. Like the fear can actually make you take action and stay focused, but beyond the fear, there's two types of fear. There's fear motivation and there's incentive motivation. A set of motivation is what you're running to fear. Motivation is what you're running from. And if you spend your whole life running from fear, you might get to a place one day you you have, you know, a six figure business and you're, everything is okay. And you're finally got all your bills paid and you know, you're not in that much fear anymore. It's not like you're running, you're totally afraid. And then you might lose your motivation because what got you here won't get you there. And that's where I think that doing the deep dive and doing soul searching and looking for the who's and things that can motivate you to get you to the next level. It's like, that's when the real work begins is when you finally get to a place where you're stable and stasis and you, everything is okay then you go out and change the world. But you got to take care of yourself first, right? Um, you got to learn how to be a leader of yourself, which is defeating your inner demons like we have here. And how do you do that? Well, I think you have to do gardening every day. You grab negative thoughts. And you hold them captive to the obedience of Christ. You stay focused and don't drift. Easier said than done, right? I want to give back to the industry and help others. I love it. Lipinski, thank you. 
What up, though? Yeah, it's nice to see you at the Equip Expo. We just got back a few days ago. It was awesome. There was thousands of people there. People were happy, pumped up, motivated. And I love going to live events, especially the Equip Expo, and seeing so many people. Like I was mind blown at how many intelligent people uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. That's just like the biggest landscape event of the year we just got back from. How many intelligent people there? Business owners, inventors, salespeople, marketing geniuses. I mean, the the amount of IQ that was in that building and on those grounds and just in the city, it was just amazing to me. You might think that you're so smart and you probably are very smart. And when you get around a bunch of other really smart people and st people that have excelled in their lines of intelligence way beyond stuff you can even wrap your head around, it makes you kind of take your hat off and it's very humbling. And then you might convert to becoming a student and then you just keep your mouth cl closed and you just learn and watch and listen. It's one of the most powerful things you can do is to be a good listener. So I wasn't, I loved being around all those people. Austin Douglas had bought $1,000 plus in Arbor Culture books this year to study to become a certified arborist. See? And he actually bought them and studied them. I love it. Congratulations, bro. Andrew Shields, thanks, man. Taval Dacris, you have the most unique name. And I apologize if I didn't pronounce it correctly. And I see you all the time. What's up, dog? <laughs> That's like my catch thing. What up, dog? And what's up, dog? And oh, shit. What? You saw me and you were too chicken to say what up, though? Man, if you ever see me live event, I don't even care if you see me just out in public. Come and say what up, though. Please come and say what's up. I, I've met people before in person that, um, how do I say this? <sighs> Some people watch my videos and then if they see me in person, They've, they've reported that they were nervous to come up and say hi to me or something like I'm not approachable. And, and I've literally, my wife has been, Hey, that guy was trying to say hi to you or something. And then you need like, you got to go catch him. And I've literally ran out into a parking lot all the way to catch somebody and spin him around and be like, bro, what up though? Oh, what's up? Kelfis, bro. And then they'll be like, I saw, I, I watched your videos, especially back in the day. So it's always the same thing. Not always the same thing, but. And they'll say something like, bro, you made this one video where at the end of the video, you started screaming and cussing and you were crying. And then I get, I get all embarrassed in real time. And he's like, and they'll be like, no, dude, that video that you made, like that was one of the main videos that helped me like believe in myself and jump over the bar. And he's like, and, and someone will be like, and now I have a whole business and everything. And I'm like, I don't take any credit for that, but I'm just trying to report back to you what I'm hearing and why it's so important to 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 put your heart out on the social media and just to, to be real because you might have you might be able to say something that can literally elevate someone out of a hole like this is powerful and then i tear up in front of people and i just want to hug people and just and, and be like man i'm so thankful that you told me that i need to hear that stuff too because i go through like depression and stuff and when people tell me things like that it makes me realize that this is all not in vain that this is worth it that this this is working right this is making a difference and so i love it and i love the mission so what are we talking about who's this is all about who stop asking how and say who who can i help by making a dope video you know who 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 we're a bunch of who's right now this ain't social media we're all we're here wow enhance the sale of each client when we are on site you said the word in enhance solely to enhance the sales of each client what's up carrie wait good to see you too
Oh, you hung out with Daniel Mirval? Yeah, dude, he's awesome. He's so passionate. Wow, you prayed for my closeness with Christ, and you're so proud to see it before your eyes. Thank you so much for that. I'm praying now in my life more than I've ever prayed in my life. And it's this weird thing. I'm, I'm not pushing my beliefs on anybody. I'm just trying to share like this crazy thing that's happened to me. There's, there's a lot of power in choice. I used to walk around saying, well, I want more proof before I can believe. I want like X, Y, Z has to happen before I will uh, believe in God or Jesus or take this leap in my business. Or like, like here's one thing that we're doing. I'll, I'll publicly say this. My wife uh, has a social media marketing agency for a couple of years now. She's like, she's brilliant. And one of her um, clients is vets returning home and they literally help uh help homeless veterans get off the street and help rehabilitate them see who's it, my my wife is a who and she's helping who a nonprofit agency called uh, organization called vets returning home who does what because yeah, i'm talking about who if you're just joining now everybody's like well how do i do it no no, no stop asking how and say who who can I go help right now? How is like this weird ethereal thing that never happens? This has changed my life. And so she says she feels like God is moving in her life and telling her to do this. And she literally, I, there's I, certain things I can't share about the numbers she's producing. But my wife has this magic touch when she promotes things on social media. She knows exactly how to craft them because her my wife's morals and standards and her, her uh, graphic design intelligence, she's so highly intelligent, but in such a a moral way. I know that sounds weird because like, what do you mean moral way? Like, okay, so basically the reason I'm saying that is because when you get really good at marketing, I've heard there becomes a moral dilemma where every single marketing piece you put out, you can get really good at copywriting and really good at conveying message. Like imagine clickbait when you go on YouTube and you were like, what? Elon Musk said, what? Oh my God, I got to And you click on it and you're like, the video is just 16 minutes and they don't even cover what the, the thumbnail promised. And then you feel kind of like it was disingenuous. But somebody who got really good at creating thumbnails, like I started back. So, so real quick, I just want to tell you some, some of the back in like, 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, before like there was this awakening in 2012. There was, I don't know what happened, but there was this big awakening in 2012. I saw it happen because I've been on social media like this forever and making videos. People were more gullible back then and they believed, they didn't understand that the people that were making these how do I say these, some of these crazy claims and conspiracy documentaries, I'm not trying to get too much in that, but people that were really good at creating headlines and titles and creating thumbnails and creating marketing messages and good at video editing could create a message. And because we hadn't woken up to like how social media and how marketing works, people would just kind of believe it because it was on a screen and they didn't question it as much. But now people could be like, that's just a, I'm not even clicking. I don't even believe that Elon Musk did what? Yeah, right. I'll believe that when I see it. It'd be, you know, it'd be. So, but it still works somehow. People can get massive amounts of clicks and views. But if you can take that skill or learn it from the certain who's and be really, really good at that type of stuff, but never, ever cross the line of doing it in a disingenuous way. It's like you sell people what they want, but you give them what they need. You can do phenomenal things in this world. You can help homeless veterans. You can help people. Um, I don't know how much I can actually say, but you can help homeless veterans. And so here's something I wanted to announce after that long, huge segue. I opened this loop. Is that like I feel this deep calling to, since I got all this cool camera gear and camera equipment, to start filming like a mini documentary that helps homeless veterans. And I don't even know why. I'm like, I can't do this. I don't got time for this. I'm running two businesses right now. And then the first thing I think about when I wake up in the morning, 
you got to start getting ready to film this. And I'm praying. I'm like, well, I don't want to film it unless I have some type of confirmation. Let's just say that. So I prayed. And my confirmation was, why don't you just put one foot in front of the other and start doing the thing? And then your confirmation will show up after you take a leap of faith. So I literally say to my wife, I go, honey, uh, we got to start filming this thing. When When is the first interview? You're going to be the DP and the, uh, the director. I'm going to be the videographer. And we got to start lining interviews up to change people's lives. <sighs> so the first interview is November 3rd. And I'm doing this for free and out of pocket on total faith because I know it'll help change people's lives and it'll do an amazing thing. Um, so if you have something that you want to share with the world or you want to do or a project that you're holding back on because you're afraid that it might not work. I really think that it's time to take a, the, the leap because there are laws in play that are standing there, standing by ready to support you and lift you up. If you would just take the leap, if you would just take the leap, there are people who there, there are who's that are just waiting for you. It's like, I got a friend who does real estate and he bought a Porsche and he was telling me how like, he literally could just go to the gas station and get gas. And because he drives a Porsche, somebody else who's also successful in real estate who would have never given him the time of day would be like, yo, uh, that's a nice ass car, man. I, I got a, I got a Porsche too. And it's not with me. Well, and they'll start talking. And next thing you know, they become friends and they get coffee and now they're doing a real estate deal together or something all because he got the Porsche. That's like a materialistic thing, but there are certain actions that you can take that will open up doors and avenues for you. And I've learned this and I'm trying to like bake this into my life. How can you put this into your life? Read the book, Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. Mm, grumpy. One I like is don't overthink it. Just do it. Sometimes you have to do it to figure it out. So the highest form of learning is the pinnacle of the highest pinnacle is that of actual experience doing it. I mean, you should analyze your risk, right? Fear is fuel. Oh, it definitely is. The CEO of yourself. You know, I watched this crazy documentary uh, a few years ago by about, about Steven Spielberg, creator of like E.T. and Batman. And uh, I think he created The Abyss and a, a bunch of amazing. It was Steven Spielberg. Come on. And people on... Um, that worked on movie sets with him said that he was so motivated that he wouldn't even eat breakfast. He just would work around the clock. And they said he worked as if Steven Spielberg worked as if he was a guy who worked for Steven Spielberg. Could you imagine that? I think that if you hate what you do for a living, you can only be the CEO of yourself for, I don't know how long until you burn out. But if you love what you do and you're passionate about it, it fuels you. It charges you up by doing it. Uh, there was a one time I was in a church a few years ago. I used to go to this one church all the time. And at the end of the sermon, this the pastor had spoke like two big crowds of people back to back. He must have been up there for three hours speaking. He's sweating. He's telling stories. People are laughing. They're crying, praying. And at the end, like the pastor gets off stage and then he goes and stands between the double doors. And now like 300 or 400 people are coming out of the church and hundreds of people are shaking his hand and talking to him. And he's laughing and saying hello as they leave the church. And, and I, this was several years ago and I wanted to be a public speaker so bad. And I understand this guy was incredible, right? I actually saw him uh, one time with his family in 
Red Lobster. I went in there to grab a carryout or Olive Garden. I was like, yo, that's that pastor from the church. And so I like paid his bill and then I ran out and I didn't even let him know it was me. It was expensive, bro. It was worth it. It was my way of saying thank you. So like I'm, I was I kind of like hid, not in a weird way, but I kind of stood around the side and I watched him like after speaking for three hours straight, still talking to all these people and, and welcoming them and, and as they were leaving. And then tears filled up. It was just dripping down my face and I was in awe. And afterwards, I was on the phone with my friend Rob, who's an NLP certified master link neurolinguistic master hypnotherapist he's a private mastery coach he's one of my best friends i'm super blessed to be <laughs> friends with someone like this i told him my experience i'm like why was i watching that pastor like in awe and i was i had tears down my, like i dream of being able to do what he does i'm like but how is he not totally exhausted and even able to talk to all those people still how is he not running and like trying to take a nap or something and he said that, well, it's an inductive experience. There's reductive and there's inductive. So think about this. The pastor is a who. And he's preaching to a bunch of who's. Because he has a message and a vision to share. He's not asking how. It's all about who. Because we're people. And, and my friend Rob said to me, he goes, uh, it's because what he is doing is an alignment. I want to get my words right. He's doing something that gives him power. He gets energy from doing it. And the more he does it is the more energy that flows through him. He's a vessel. He's a conduit, right? It's more and more and more and more and more. It doesn't end. You get energy by doing it. Versus doing something that you hate that's not in alignment with your mission, your mandate, the, the core experience of your life of who you, what you were even meant to do. If you're trying to force yourself to do something you hate, just doing it will drain you. Do you have anybody in your life that's an anybody who's a who in your life, who's an energy vampire? And just by talking with them for five minutes, you feel like you've just got your life energy just sucked out of you and you're totally exhausted and like, oh my God. Do you have anybody like that in your life? Some of those people, they do something called the mean sweet cycle. It's like a pendulum. You take a break from them. Like, I can't deal with this. I love this person, but I can't deal with him all the time. So you take a break. And then they'll get really sweet and nice. And they'll be the, the side of them that you love. And they're laughing and they're funny and they're supportive. You're like, oh my God, like, what was I thinking? I love this person. This is the best person ever. This person fills my heart with joy. So you get around them again, or you get on the phone with them and you spend time with them. And then as soon as they get you in their clutches, they stick you. <laughs> and then with, and then they start the energy man, but start sucking your energy again. It was almost like the whole thing was a trick. It's called the mean sweet cycle. It's a thing narcissists do anyways. We'll get off track here. So read the book by Dan Sullivan called Who Not How. You want to buy a Keith Kelfas hat? Huh. You can go to keithkelfas.com and go over to the merchandise tab and we have all of our merchandise. I don't think I have any of it right now. It's all Untrapped Podcast. And you can also listen to my podcast, Untrapped Podcast. We just crossed like 600,000 downloads. Nighty night. Thanks for summer. What's up, Gabe? Thanks, man. You're welcome. Brent, I've literally cried over making everything work for my customers and technicians. I always love when you go live. There's a lot of power and belief. We're making it happen. There is a lot of power and belief. If anybody's watching this right now and you happen to be depressed... Um, there's something that actually works. Oh, well, I can't give any, excuse me. I can't prescribe anything, especially on a video or give any advice and I'm not licensed or qualified, but I know one thing, if you choose, 
to not be depressed and you choose to be happy and stable. And then you literally get physically moving and jump up and down and start, you know, praying and shouting hallelujahs and start like, it's almost like you're in a spiritual battle. Start literally punching, go hide your behind your garage or in your car and just get, get radical. And, um, Tony Robbins used to talk about how motion creates emotion. Start. Uh, there's a book by Stuart Wilde. Uh, this is back in the day, some deep motivation, like ethereal stuff, weird stuff, but it was super, super powerful. I read a lot of books and he talks about get up every night at 4.09 a.m. Just pick a random time and then go out into your garden or out in your backyard and just find a random rock and your job is to take that rock and move it from here to there and then go back to bed you're like what do you mean why would you say to wake up wake up at 409 a.m every night and move a rock and you got to do this for 30 days and then the next night peel yourself out of bed and go move that rock from here to there and do it again and again and again and again and again until it becomes a habit and the whole point is the reason why is because you said so. Because, hey, my, my dogs came in the studio. Because your word is law. So if you don't stick to what you said you were going to do, and you let yourself off the hook all the time, then you could become like depressed. That's one thing about owning a service business is it's riddled with deadlines. You have so many customers that you have your promise out to and your word is on the line and your reputation. So you got to be there. You got to be there at 7.30 a.m. or 9 a.m. You have to get this job done at the time. You got to communicate with them. You got to follow up with them. You got to do all these things because your integrity to everybody else. But you might be so exhausted internally from doing everything for everybody else all the time. You might be an empathic type of person that's constantly giving of yourself and then you come home and you have to give to your family. There's no time to give back to yourself or to open up and be receptive for your own abundance, love, well-being, well, whatever that is. And then you feel like you're getting robbed. And if you do that long enough, you can literally fall into a deep depression where you hate your life, you hate your business and it's falling apart. And that's why I think it's very risky to build a million or a multi-million dollar business with 15, 25 employees if it's not something that you love. Because if you're doing it just to chase the money or to run away from fear and or to make your dad proud of you or to prove something, you might wake up one day and have 30 people on payroll and realize that you're doing this for all the wrong reasons and now you're literally miserable and you can't help it. But the thing, if you don't got it set up right, it could literally all just fall apart because of depression drugs alcohol and depression are huge huge things that stop people from getting successful so who can you find who's been through that path that maybe you can get some coaching from or lean on wait 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 Michael Lipinski, you're 40, but six years ago, I discovered your how to start a lawn care business videos. I was a broke rapper, no car, walking the neighborhood with the push mower. Now I have a legit lawn care business. Just bought my second commercial, zero turn. Between you and Brian's lawn maintenance, YouTube, CPL, and others, I gained a plethora of knowledge of watching you build. Man, you were a rapper? A broke rapper. I used to do music. I won't get too deep into this, but I'm literally about to buy a Yamaha. I don't know. It's like a super nice, expensive keyboard. I got a keyboard over there. I got microphones. I got preamps, compressors. I got a studio booth. Like I can do music anytime I want. I've got studio programs, beats, and I don't really do it that much because uh, it becomes like addictive. And uh, but but the interesting thing about being a musician. This is like you have to like make it you literally have to go platinum to make any money or have merchandise and sponsorship and brand deals and all these different ways that you monetize it. And it's a hard, hard, hard hustle, especially uh, today. And if you are a musician and you're really good at what you do, I think you should definitely have a YouTube channel. You should be on all social media and constantly be 
publishing, uploading, and working on projects. And in order to make any money, it's like you, if what you love, the music you love doesn't resonate with people, then it might not blow up and make any money. So you'd have to find this healthy balance of doing what other people want to hear instead of like this eclectic type of music. If I ever got into music again, that would suck. I feel like I would have to be like, just make music that, see, it's a tough thing. I think oh, that was the next thing I wanted to talk about. That's what the, I segued into here is you could have something you totally love. Like you might love painting or doing art or building sculptures or whatever. You have passion projects. So maybe your service business can be this whole conduit and it's a structure that creates the cash flow to pay all your bills and then some. So you can do other things that you love. There are people who have multiple businesses, five, six, seven businesses, and they invest in businesses and build them so the, the businesses are for a purpose. They're structures. So this weird transition happens where somebody might be totally in love with their lawn and landscaping business and they're so passionate about it. And then after like pretty much the year five mark, they wake up from this dream and they realize, oh my God, I've been working like 70 hours a week for five years and I'm not in love with this business anymore. And they become depressed and might want to quit. It's like this itch, this five-year itch. Well, what if you transition the way you look at your business and you got some coaching from some people that can help you take your business to a whole new level and decide what you actually want to do? Because if you just keep growing it out of fear, Miko. Hey, hey, it's okay. Shh, relax. Hey, hey, hey. You know why he's freaking out? This is <laughs> because there's a bone over there. And Gino got the bone. Gino got your bone. Uh-oh. So our little dog, Gino, if Miko has a bone, the older dog, Gino will try to sneak around and take it. And he thinks it's a game and Miko gets pissed off. You got your bone? I don't even know how they got in here. Who, not how. Oh, I love it. Keith, I disagree. The highest pinnacle of learning is the reinforcement of what you know by teaching it to another. Oh, that's so good. Yes, because teaching uh, installs accountability. Something happens in the brain where you learn something because you go meta. And there's this thing Jack Canfield has. It's called Train the Trainer. He has this whole program. I think it's like $25,000 to get into it. And so he literally teaches people how to like go meta. There's, there's level one leader, two, three, four, five, and then level six leaders. I think it's like a level one leader is somebody who just like leads themselves. A level two leader, you know, can lead other people, like a team of people. A leather, a level three leader coaches and advises people who lead teams of people, right? Like a CEO, right? But then a level four leader is somebody who coaches and advises people who coach and advise people who lead teams of people a level five leader is like this is like a world leader type stuff i know that sounds really weird and spooky i don't mean it like that and i don't even really even know what i'm talking about i'm just trying to remember but a level five leader is somebody who consults people who lead people who coach and lead teams of people. So it's like, and then a level six leader is like the highest leader of all. And that would be like, um, well, if you think of it at all, it's like some of the most influential leading people who have ever walked the planet ever. Like, I don't even know. I can't even wrap my head around it. It's insane. And it makes me think about these different densities of consciousness like 2d is like rocks and tables we live in a three-dimensional world 4d is like when you're in the mind and spirit and 5d is where like 
you become so spiritual and highly evolved that you can almost no longer hold a physical body. And then 60 is where you are. You realize the omnipresence and of the entire universe is everywhere and nowhere at once. And you were one with all things and all sentient beings. And then 70 is where you are aware of all the universe and omnipresence and you are everywhere at once and you realize that you are all things and all things are you that you literally are the universe unfolding and evolving all right now but you are holding all of that objectified you are you have it all of that but objectified and then level eight density i feel really weird right now sharing this as like because i don't know what the hell i'm talking about but i'm fascinated because if you talk about stuff like this and you learn about it a little bit and you follow people like david data in his book, Cosmic Consciousness and the One, Two, Three of God, he talks in these kind of like neuro linguistic patterns that break your brain and make you realize that there's many different other uh, possibilities and levels of intelligence that I'm going to shut up. Thank you, Matthew. Exactly, Brent. Massachusetts. Thank you for just suggesting Jobber. Oh, cool. I'll just do a plug then. Guys, I use Jobber software in my business for over three years now. I love it. I run my whole business on Jobber. I've been on Jobber all day, actually, sending invoices, collecting money from clients, doing change orders. We use Jobber constantly. It runs the whole business. And uh, I love it. I couldn't run my business without it. And they're doing a special before the end of the month. If you sign up and get a free two-week trial with my link at getjobber.com slash Keith. If you decide to sign up before the end of the month, they're doing an amazing Equip Expo deal because it was so the month of the Equip Expo where you save 50% off your first three months, which is a huge discount on Jobber. So. You can even pause this and take out your phone right now and go to getjobber.com slash Keith. Sign it with my link. And get 50% off your first three months and you can run your whole business on it. It makes you money. I'm sponsored by Jobber. So I get paid to say stuff like that. Isn't that cool? I'm trying to do paver. Who would you recommend? I don't know. There's this amazing guy named Cruz Lon. It's spelled C-R-U-X-L-O-N. Look him up on Facebook. And he's doing these uh, these meetups and these trainings. That could do the best. Depression. I'm there now. Thanks for admitting that publicly. That was bold of you, bro. Yeah, depression is sucks and it's real. And people who aren't depressed, they're like, why are you depressed? You shouldn't be depressed. I'm not depressed. How could you be depressed? What is there to be depressed about? And the person who's depressed don't feel that way. Because when you actually are the one who's depressed and you're going through it, like it's like this thing that jumps on your back and takes over you. And it, it, it pulls out all of your happiness and you can't access happiness anymore. And you're just a shell walking around depressed. And it's like not fun at all. So I feel you, bro. And on this live video, hey, you told me you're depressed. So I would say, hey, I hope that in this very instant, boom, the depression is lifted off of you completely for good in this very moment. Whatever you need to let go, you let go. Let go and let God. And I hope that you are very, very well. And I hope that you message me privately or you on here and say, I'm no longer depressed. Depression sucks, bro. I feel you. That's powerful, Mike Lipinski. I did. I got some stuff. I sold a lot, a lot of screen. You did more of a conscious hip hop, and what people want to hear is not what it did. What I did, yeah, dude. That's one thing about like music. I, I listen to like 
a lot of I like classic rock. If you listen to uh, the uh, Power versus Force by Dr. David R. Hawkins, they've actually measured the calibrations of music. And some of the highest, like next to classical, higher vibration. Like this is real. Like, um, it's a long conversation, but it's positive. But like heavy metal and rap had a more negative type. But some hip hop has positive energy, like vibes for real. But if you listen to the lyrics of some of the really popular music, it's just gross. I'm like, I I tried to play it and listen to it, and I just as soon as I hear the lyrics, I'm like. I am not. I can't even drive around and listen to this crap. I like the the beats are good. The rappers are great. Like some of the cool stuff. But like you listen to what they're saying, I like that doesn't even resonate with who I am at all as a person. I can't listen to this, so I shut it off and I'll go back and listen to something else. It just so if you're making actual positive music and conscious things you're talking about, no wonder people don't. It's not blowing up. It's it's weird, but I think that our entire human race is going to evolve something is holding us back but something's going to pop and um it's going to get amazingly positive powerful so i have a friend uh, uh responding to this comment once a hobby becomes a job, it's no longer a hobby and it can become burdensome. I have a friend who does coaching for free and it changes people's lives. I'm like, bro, why don't you charge money? He's like, well, I, people can give me a donation and some people give him like a thousand bucks. But a lot of people he coaches for free. I said, but why don't you charge money? He says, as soon as I turn it into a business and I start adding money to the coaching, it turns it into a grind and it ruins it. So if I'm trying to coach somebody and actually get them results in their life, but I'm thinking about how I need money or is this going to make me money? The, the building, putting in commerce, because sometimes can pull the equity and the real value because the higher level of value is in the transformation for the other person. It's not about the money. And if the person can't afford the money, then why would he stop them from getting transformation that can change their life? This helped me because this guy coached me for free when I was going through really hard depression a long time ago and I couldn't afford to pay him anything. And then what did I do? I got way better financially. And now I've given this guy money every single time he's coached me, but I couldn't afford to pay him in the beginning. And I'm so thankful because I don't know where I would be without him. So if, the, if there's somebody that you can help and don't think about money all the time. exactly all the marketing that you learn in music promoting your music if you when you take that and you apply it to a service business you can blow a service business up really fast because you already have a lot of experience with marketing and hustling like that my dogs i have a lhasa apso who's 15 a party Yorkie who's two and a half and then a standard just like Yorkie. She's like five now or six. Aloha. Very nice. Very nice. Have I ever thought about taking phone calls during a live? Yeah. Uh, during a live. I can. I have the road. I'm going to start doing that actually this winter. Thanks for reminding me, Austin. I have uh, the whole podcast set up over here and I can take live phone calls. I have the ability to do that. I just have to get it all plugged into the system and then we can start taking calls. That sounds awesome. Thank you for that. That's going to be epic, bro. Thank you for that. Very nice. Amazing. Yeah. 
Are you asking me what's my favorite part of being a business owner? It's kind of sad, but it's to not have to work for somebody else. Well, I guess I have hundreds of bosses because my clients, I work for them. But uh, yeah, I can't not stand another person, especially like some egotistical man telling me what to do and what time. Like I've I had a lot of I've had a lot of jobs, like 32 jobs, and I've worked for landscaping companies. And I've just had bosses breathing down my neck, like didn't give a shit about me. It was more about what I performed and how much money I made them and calling me up on Sunday saying stuff like, yo, your performance at work this week, that was a B game. I need to see an A game when you show up Monday. Are you going to show up Monday with your A game? Sunday. And I'm like, yeah, man, no, because if you don't, we're going to have to talk about maybe you going and working somewhere else. And I'm like, dude, like I'm showing up every day on time, working my ass off, trying my hardest. And he's talking about how that's a B game. And I was like, no matter, and the harder you work is the more they try to squeeze out of you, bro. I'm traumatized. That's why I started my own business. <laughs> and I think it, it it's not a weakness. But in my business, I've had employees and pretty much everybody who's ever worked for me say things like, bro, it's different here, Kelfus. Like, you're not like breathing down my neck. And I'm like, well, because I've had that. I know what that feels like. <sighs> What's up? Thanks, bro. You're welcome. Amazing. I love it, Landon. Thank you. Growing a window company. I don't even know where you're at. I know one thing that I learned. If you market and advertise your ass off for doing, you know, big ass houses, like you know, five hundred dollar ticket and up as much as possible. Lots of water fed pole work inside and out, and um, you can grow a multiple six figure business. And then getting into packages and selling soft washing, roof cleaning, gutter cleaning, concrete cleaning. We just did a house today. We cleaned. It was a small ranch, but we cleaned the windows inside, and I gave him a deal because we did so much it was a package it was like a thousand seventy three dollars and we clean the windows inside and out clean the screens clean the front porch the back porch and then power wash the eaves troughs and vinyl siding did i say clean the gutters and it was like a thousand seventy three bucks and it was like easily three and a half hour job but i trained a new guy in the pressure washer today and so it took like five and a half hours but i was able to only be on the job for i think i was on the job for 45 no i was on the job for like an hour because i was training a new guy and so after all the expenses of running the business they didn't have time to go to another job what did i make after all expenses and payroll the other guy was out. My other guy was out cleaning windows. So he did a house for 300 bucks. They didn't want screens done. A lot of times they do want screens. So you can get another like 60 bucks in there, like 360. And then he did another thing. So we did like 11, 12, 13, 14. I don't know, 1400 bucks today, just under 1400. And they worked like to like, what time are they done? lunch five and a half hours half hour lunch but i pay him for lunch so six hours i don't know what i made today i gotta do the math five six hundred bucks and i worked an hour but i was running around doing quotes 
I get anxiety talking about that. So we just did window cleaning and pressure washing. That's what we do on Mondays. I don't know what that what that means, but imagine if you have like five crews out doing that and they're all doing twelve to fifteen hundred bucks a day. And then you got an office manager and you got, you know, spending a couple grand a month in marketing and advertising, you got a bookkeeper, and you obviously have an accountant, and then um I don't know. So you do a half a million a year and you could probably pocket a hundred grand. And you probably pay most of that on payroll. But how do you get there? <laughs> I said, how, right? That's not what we're talking about. Who are the customers and the clients you need? And who are the employees? Because when you say how, you're like, well, how are you going to do that? Wrong question. Who do I need to be? I'll, I'll share something with you guys real quick because we're late in the video. I should do, I don't know. I think I'm looking at 400 grand this year, maybe 375. I have no idea yet. Three, let's say safe. I'll do 375,000 this year. I am more money conscious and more of a saver and kind of a tight wad and more obsessed with efficiency and more I don't feel broke but whew, I pay attention to money way more than when I was at like 50 or 100 grand or 150 or 200 and I feel like I'm in cash flow purgatory because I feel like like once you break hundred and fifty thousand you feel like you're gonna make more and more money but you just have more and more expenses i don't know i don't know if that's why i'm actually paying to get coaching because my anyways let's go to these Freedom. I love taking care of customers and clients. It's awesome. How do you message me? Oh, sorry. Hit me up on Facebook or Instagram. DM messages or you can send me an email at the landscaping employee trap at gmail.com. Or if you want to get on the phone with me, go to keithkelfis.com slash call. Clint, bro, nice to see you. I remember you very well, sir. Do you go door to door marketing? Not anymore. I just put a stack of door hangers in the truck for the guys to pass out. They're called five arounds. And I don't think they've passed out one. <laughs> so I got to literally remind them, hey, but they're so busy working. And then they get off the job site and it's 5 p.m. And then it's like, so we got to figure out how to work that in these five rounds. What are your thoughts on paying your employees commission? There's this amazing book. My Mike Andy's called P for P pay for performance. And I really dug into this, this winter, I spent a lot of time and by the spring, I was hundred percent convinced that I'm moving into all commission pay only. And I do pay, uh, window cleaners. If like my one guy cleans windows, if he's going out without me, I pay him 33%, which is actually pretty good of whatever he makes. So he can go make hundreds of dollars in a day. He's happy. I'm happy. I didn't have to be there. If anything goes wrong, he's got to go back and fix it. That's like the rule. So I pay some commission there. And then I also do commissions and we do bigger jobs. And we do jobs that are like $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 landscaping jobs. What I do is I bake in a bonus commission on the jobs. So I'll be like, hey, guys, we're doing this job. It's like ten grand, and um, it's going to take us several days. And I baked in a $400 bonus commission bonus for each of you or 400 for you or whatever they're doing, because I know that this job is going to be hard or, and it's just like a, like a motivator. And then 
But as far as commission, I was doing the math and based off the numbers and metrics and man hour rates I'm getting in my business, commission is not going to work. Here's why. Um, if I pay them strictly commission, the goal is to get them so they're making more money than they would at an hourly rate because it's like a big motivator. They would probably actually end up making less money and be mad at me because um, I'm struggling to get the man hour rates that I need in my area. I'm sales and marketing and doing quotes. And 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 so what I need to make in order to pay them a commission, I'm just making a, there's a lot of competition and I'm not getting the man hour rates I need. So I make sure that they get paid, they're getting their check. And then if, so I'm, I'm going back to the drawing board and I'm getting some coaching on that myself because it's really irritating and pissing me off that I hear about these guys that are making these tremendous amounts of money in their business and it's just money flying everywhere. And in my service business, um, the business works and it makes money, but to go full blown commission, I just want to figure out the math before I just jump into that. Because if a guy is going to make a certain amount in a week, Oh yeah, here's your commission. Now it could be part commission. Maybe I should fiddle with that. Or I could do like an experiment. And then with commission as well, you have to track everything for each job. So if you do a job that bleeds over to the next day, it's a day and a half. And then the next day and a half at three o'clock, they said another job. You're going to be tracking all of that. So you have to have your tracking down. You have to have your, your, your sales on point and your numbers dialed in and reverse engineered. So you know exactly what the hell you're charging. So you're paying them proper commission. So it's a whole bunch of extra administrative work that I thought for sure I was going to do this year. And when the year broke in, I was like, oh, I'm just going to stick to hourly one more year. Anyways, it wasn't too fun. That's awesome, Brent. Thank you. Yeah, very smart, Landon. Uh, you guys still watching this? Pay attention to this. He said, "I typically I rather stick to one service and become a professional in that service, so you can charge more without increasing your workload." When you first start a service business, you can actually make a lot more money a lot faster and get on your feet. You might have to do this. You might not have a choice. Is to expand. Uh, and offer a whole bunch of different services. I'll cut your lawn. I'll paint your shed. I'll power wash your house. I'll do everything. I'll clean your windows. I'll pull the weeds. I'll do trim the shrubs. I'll do mulch. I'll do decorative stone. I'll, do, I'll trim your trees. Um, because you have access to a lot more services. And because if you don't, if you don't know how to get customers, you don't have the capital to market and advertise and get customers just for one or two services, you might be able to offer just a couple customers that you're getting now more services. So you can, they'll keep you on their property longer. So you could do more stuff, do more shit, make more money. But the problem is, is once you start getting 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 customers, now you got all these customers that you're doing all these different things for. And it gets really, really confusing quick. And you have all this different weird equipment and like, you're trying to like grab a weed whip and like it's on the ground and there's paint brushes on it and you got to move the power washer to the side and like, and then you try to train employees like one day they're like power washing and the next day they're trimming trees and then the next day they're cleaning windows and then they don't they can't even learn anything it's a nightmare i've been here i've been there it's the dumbest thing ever so then you want to like narrow back down. So, but if you can, and you can force yourself to stay very focused, just stick with like one to two services. A quick story. I'll tell you if you're still here, say what up though in the comments. My friend told me that he was part of this private business mastermind several years ago. And I've told the story a couple of times. Very powerful. Uh, I said, everybody stand up. Now sit down if you do um, less than 100000 a year. And a bunch of people sat down, right? He said, okay, sit down if you do less than a quarter million, and then a half a million. And people kept sitting down. And he said, sit down if you do less than a million. 
most everybody else sat down and there was like, you know, nine people left standing out of this big room. Okay. All these people do a million bucks a year. We'll sit down. If you do less than 5 million, most everybody sat down except for like, um, like three people and then sit down. If you do less than 10 million, the two other people sat down and it was just one dude standing. He goes 15 million. 20 million and it's just one dude standing there and everybody else is sitting down and then the whole room is looking like what the hell does this guy do for a living what is his business and everybody's captured and he goes she's like what do you do and he said it they they reported that the guy looked kind of like just like a nerdy guy wearing glasses kind of short like you never would have guessed this guy had a 20 million dollar business he's like well we do over 20 million a year and we do gutter cleaning and um Everybody's like, okay. He goes, and what else? That's all. Gutter cleaning. And everybody's like perplexed. He's like, no, like we're like, I don't remember what state it was, but he's like, we're the number one gutter cleaning company in New Jersey or we're multiple states and we are the best in the world at just cleaning gutters. If you got gutters, we can clean it. And all they do is the way they train their employees, the way they market and advertise and hire, everything is they're the number one at just cleaning gutters. And they scaled that thing a cookie cutter all the way to the top. I, I don't know how to do that. I'm just reporting what I've heard. That sounds insane to me, but it's a great like thing to think about of, and I've watched it happen in my business. If you're trying to train people five different services, you're going to have a long, hard road. I think the only reason I even do window cleaning and pressure washing anymore is because we have so many customers that we do their landscaping and pressure washing and window cleaning and they've grandfathered in to the business so that's what i'm having a coaching call i'm literally paying somebody to coach me because i'm stuck and i'm trying to figure out what i'm going to do i want to grow the window cleaning business and get it going but there's so much administrative work on that side so i'm finding the who who has done that and seeing what we want to do next year because uh anyways the more money you make, the faster it leaves your hands. Yeah. So many expenses. I was just uh, voxering back and forth with Dan Plata from Blue Sky Services. He's the bookkeeping. He owns the bookkeeping agency that does all of my books for both of my businesses. And the guy's a genius. But excuse me, my back. He, he was talking about uh, he taught me. We did a deep dive a few years ago, and he taught me so much about finances and costs of goods sold and overhead and fixed and variable costs and how the business looks. We did a whole deep dive uh, podcast on the Intrap Podcast or on my YouTube channel at Keith Kelfis. Twelve steps to growing your business. If you got a couple hours to watch this, I promise you, even though it's free on YouTube, it's amazing. And if you need a bookkeeper in your business to help you manage all your books, go to yourblueskies.com slash kelfus or just go to keithkelfus.com slash resources and you can get access to all my resources of software that i use in my business hookups on the companies that i use that help me run my two businesses and you can get all types of discounts have you looked into real estate to avoid paying taxes yes i've been saving up right now for a few years to invest in my first piece of real estate and I've only been saving a tiny bit each week, so I don't have a lot saved. I was thinking about getting a and specifically just for real estate. I'm not talking about like, like I don't have any money in my business account and I'm just going to blow it on like real estate. I mean, I, I like opened up a separate savings account specifically for saving up for an Airbnb or whatever. And I just kept throwing a couple, a couple hundred bucks a week in there for like forever. And, um, and I'm like scared to make the move. I feel like I just don't know enough and real estate money is very slow and I'm seeing higher returns in other places. And, but then I can, I'll go buy 500 bucks on Tesla and then another 500 on Tesla. And then I go buy 500 more on Tesla. Then I go buy Ethereum and some Bitcoin and Cardano and Polkadot. And then I go buy some Apple stock. And it's like, um, Anyways, yeah. Sorry, I didn't answer the question. Have you looked into real estate to avoid paying taxes? I do watch a lot of Kiyosaki and Grant Cardone, and I don't know. I'm not qualified to answer that, but I am I am familiar with how you can just keep rolling the money into the next real piece of real estate. So eventually, I mean, that's every business owner's eventual goal is to get into real estate, right? So you can have wealth. I mean, 
I I can't say it here, but there's certain businesses that you get involved. You can have a multi-million dollar business and that business can be gone overnight. Real estate is right there. That's the property. It's going to be sitting there for hundreds of years. So you can't deny that. I'll probably get into it. You're at 144K. That's awesome. It's enough despite a lot of YouTubers pushing me to do more. If they're pushing you and it's good, that's good. If they're pushing you and you don't like it, don't watch them. Because there's some YouTubers out there that will tell you, you need to blow up to a million bucks as fast as possible. And if you're not ready for that, you're just not. Oh, man, thank you. I really appreciate it. Amen. I really love that. My friend Anthony Heyman in his window cleaning business was talking about how he, instead of incentivizing employees to upsell work and they get a commission on that upsell. That is what I need to put in my business right now. Let me take a, I got to take a voice memo for that. Sorry guys, but this is powerful. Quick note, quick note to myself, uh, incentivize employees to upsell work and then give them a commission on the upsold work. And it's a win-win. They get a commission on the upsell as well as their hourly wage and your business gets more work. Tony McPhee from CNA Services Credit. I love that. Thanks, man. That was really, really good. How do you feel about telling your people what you are making on a job? I don't because I feel it would discourage them if they knew what I was bringing in. Case in point. Today, the customer paid one of my employees. And um, I don't care if they do or if they don't because I'm super transparent. And uh, and I won't say who the employee was or anything. I'm not saying any personal information. But he called me up. He goes, bro. I didn't realize you made this much money on that job. If you if you would have asked me, I thought it would have been a different amount, like less. I said, well, if you want to know, I'll tell you every little aspect of what the job and what it charge and why I charge that much and what it cost and why. We did the gutters and because it was part of a deal. Instead of 200, it was 199. And then we did the windows as normally three, but then we did the windows for two. And then the screens, there was like screens and this. And then we cleaned the concrete and then the walkway. And then we did the pressure washing. We did all blah, 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 And it came up to like 1100 bucks. And, um, and then I talked about the cost of goods sold and the overhead and the payroll. The payroll company that we, we have to pay just to do it. Just to, to manage the payroll and the filings, the unemployment insurance, the taxes, the FICA, the health, the... And then I talked about the pay on workers comp, general liability insurance, the, the trucks, the fuel in the trucks, the cost of mistakes and breakdowns, marketing and advertising, the cost of having a bookkeeper paying uh, hundreds of dollars a month just to manage the books and the cost to pay an accountant a few thousand bucks to do that. And then the cost of the quarterly payroll taxes, end of year taxes, and then the cost for the office and then the cost <laughs> <laughs> and i was like then i, I was because like you got to like say all this stuff so i was like so at the end of the day yeah i actually made pretty decent money today um but then i gotta be like well this and this and this and this and this i don't fucking know man but I want anybody who works for me to go start their own business and go become a cajillionaire. I would love to be calling them, asking them, how are you making this money? And they'd be like, don't ask how, ask who. Because I don't think none of us have the answers. But yeah, if, uh, if uh, uh, customers do it all the time, they'll literally come out on a job site right in front of us, me and my employees. They're not my employees, but they're guys who work for me. You know, They're my employees. 
they're the businesses and boys. I don't like talking like that. It's weird. They're like, okay, so this job was 7,000, right? The customer is saying this, right? So you wanted a deposit of uh, 33%. What's the deposit on seven? Uh, it's right there in the contract, sir. Um, okay, so uh, how much to do this? And the customer will come out with a stack of hundreds in their hand and just like give it to someone and walk away. And I'd just be like, sometimes it makes my stomach turn because there's this weird thing I want to share. If you ever told somebody you had at one point, I don't know, I'll make a random or you, you got 50 grand in the bank. Well, to somebody who, no, I don't know, the people who work for me might have a million bucks. I have no idea, but it's not about that. It's just totally different. Somebody might not have anywhere near as much money as you have, or they might, I don't know. But let's say you tell somebody you got 50 grand in the bank. This weird thing happens in human psychology where they go, Joe has 50 grand in the bank. Wow. And then literally like three years could go by. I don't heard, I've never heard anybody talk about this. Like three years could go by and they don't even know what Joe's been through or what's happened. But like, they just always think Joe's got 50 grand in the bank. And like Joe might've had 50 grand in the bank for 10 minutes. And then like, I don't know, like something happened and it cost him like 12 grand. Then he, he was about to buy a car or, or invest in something or do something like, you never know, someone could have got sick. Maybe Joe only has like three grand in the bank. Joe's got 50 grand in the bank. It's like 12 years later and Joe's like, oh, I'm Joe. And then the guy walks up. What do you mean? I thought you had 50 grand in the bank, Joe's. And then, you know, it's like ever telling anybody how much money you got in the bank you can tell them if you want i don't know i'm pretty transparent but I don't know, it's just kind of funny to me how we think but i grew up around people who were broke and broke and broken minded and like uh used weird guilt trips around money and like oh you got that extra hundred dollars from that thing so now uh, this means that like over little petty ass amounts of money too. I've watched people be so petty over petty amounts of money growing up because they were so broke. And I think about, and I dissect my own consciousness of my life growing up. I'm like, Oh my God, those were broke thoughts. I remember being like 14 and I wore clothes from the thrift store my whole life. Basically when my wife met me, she's like, where did you get all these clothes? I was like, uh, I shop at the thrift store exclusively. Look at all these nice clothes. I was wearing shirts that are too big for me. Nice old man button up shirts and corduroy pants and shit. Dude, I thought I was the boss. When I was in, I was in middle school, junior high. I never went to a high school. I got kicked out of school. I was a bad kid and I went to alternative schools. I like dropped out in 10th grade. But uh, I was literally walking around in dress clothes that I got from a thrift store in school that were too big for me. That's how I dressed. I was really like poor, but I thought I looked sweet. So anyways, and I was so poor that I was a hoarding pack rat. Like I hoarded all my old clothes and stuff and all these, the stupid shit I brought. And when I met my wife, she saved my life, bro. I remember when we got our first apartment together, I got this picture of her. She's got like, like a bunch of hangers with all my old shitty thrift store clothes and like a hat on like this helping me move. And she was exhausted. She's like, I didn't know you had all this shit. And we move into this tiny apartment together and we're getting engaged. And I, and I had the whole closet and drawers and Tupperware filled with all these old clothes. She's like, we have to do a purge Keith. I'm like a purge. And I'm like crying over shit that I had dragged with me my whole life. And got rid of all these old crappy clothes and just like, and then, and then I was like, I would go sneak. This sounds weird and vulnerable. And I would, the clothes that she convinced me to throw away, then I would go actually, no, no, you can't throw away that. And I was so poor, man. God. Anyways, it's like today I have like really nice clothes. <sighs> We just got back from the Equip Expo, excuse me, and my wife like packs for me and everything, 
and and she's like, we got to go to the mall and buy you some new clothes so you look crispy at the uh, expo. I'm like, but I don't care about looking crispy. She's like, no, you need to look crispy, Keith. I was like, well, I have brand new clothes with the tags still on it, hiding in my dresser drawers and in the closet. She's like, what? So I open up the drawer and I lift up some T-shirts. I still have three shirts brand new from like over the last two or three years that I'm afraid to wear because I don't want to ruin them. And then if you move my closet, dude, I have a, I don't know why I'm not bragging about this. I'm just like, I'm actually making a joke. Um, she's like, why don't you wear them? You have all these nice clothes. I'm like, cause I'm afraid to mess them up. <laughs> cause, cause I'm like the, the poverty mindset has, has messed me up, bro. <laughs> That's funny. If you see me looking off to the side, obviously, because I'm reading at the computer here, I'm not just like just looking i'm actually reading the comments obviously very nice you're about to hire dan plata for some coaching on your books mention the name keith kelfus and save a hundred and I think you said like a hundred. You save a lot of money if you mention my name. Yeah, good debt. I got a life insurance policy, and I'm looking at the these different ways to build wealth. I, I paid $1,200 to join a program by Mike Dillard called it Richer Every Day. Bro, it's the best $1,200 I ever spent. And he just keeps, I'm in this like group. They just did a coaching call today. I'm like, bro, I joined this thing like not this last winter, but the winter before. So this has been like a year and a half ago I joined this thing and they're still uploading, doing weekly coaching. And I'm like, I feel like bad. Like I need to like, send this guy an email and send him some more money because the stuff he taught me changed my life. I wish this gets cropped out and sent as a testimonial video It's called richer every day. I'll give you a snippet of what he talked about. One of the many trainings. So check this out. He talks about these addictions, like, like a drug addiction to money like the neuropeptides in the brain. I'm not talking about people that like, I'm talking about good people, but people that are high earners, business owners, self-employed, athletes, even movie stars, people who make a high income that live these high lifestyles and they they go crazy. They, they buy big houses and fancy cars and Range Rovers and vacation homes and they can't stop spending money. It becomes this addiction. And then the more and more they spend it, like it doesn't get them as excited. They finally get like, you know, a Lamborghini and it only lasts like a month. And then the high is gone. They got to buy something else, but they make so much money that they can afford it because they make so much money. Well, this addiction is rolling where now they're, they're spending, they could be spending $300,000 a month on just buying shit and excreting their lifestyle, but they make so much money that they can afford it. Well, eventually that something happens in these people's careers, high earners. I'm what I'm laying down right now, what I'm talking about, this is not from Keith Kelfus. This is a who that I paid to teach me this stuff. And so, and I, and if, if you want to know where I got it from, so he doesn't watch this and get pissed off at me. I'm giving you a snippet of what I learned from Mike Dillard. The guy's a brilliant marketer. And the course is called Richer Every Day. Go give him 1200 bucks and get inside this thing and I'll see you in there. He's probably charging more by now. He should. But he said, 
because the beginning of this stuff, it's a cryptocurrency course too, as part of it. It's one part of many financial things that he teaches. Crypto is one part. I mean, he talks about like being very careful about your cryptocurrency addictions, because when it crashes, you could lose all your money and you should be peeling off profits on the way to the top allocated percentages and don't be fooled. And, and all these different things about like the mindset of profit, how you should have purely passive income. <sighs> okay, I'm going too far. But basically said these high earners, when something goes astray and their income stops or goes down or there's something where they're not making money all of a sudden. And I can attest to this. I took another course called 10X Wealth and Business. And they said something so profound. I just want to join these two points together because there's like an emergent property what I'm talking about. If you're paying attention, this is, this is powerful shit. If you're making buku bucks, you can't help yourself. At some point, you start, I'm just going to increase my lifestyle. I can finally do it. I've been working. We rationalize. We justify. I've been, do, I've been working so hard for so long, and I finally, I deserve it. I deserve to get my dream house and the car and the vacation and the camper and all these things. And you start getting it, and it doesn't even phase you because you're making so much money. But when you get in the habit of spending so much money like that, and then you get your, you start spending on credit, you don't mind because you're paying your credit cards off because you make so much money. At some point, if there's a dip in the economy and your business and the income, or you get sick, anything, all of a sudden, that twenty, thirty, fifty thousand a month you're spending. I got a client who makes it, who, who just blows. I have a client who blows thirty thousand at least a month just on his American Express black card on what he calls stupid shit. He doesn't even know he like he's 30 grand a month on top of all of his other expenses. It gets like that. So, but if something happens literally for one month and you don't have money coming in all of a sudden, now you're you can't stop spending, and then it becomes like, okay, well, at least I can cover it for this month. But two to three months, you could literally go into debt, you could literally end up in a really sticky spot. So, he talks about that's one of many scenarios, but he talks about how these people eventually dig themselves into a hole that they never thought they could possibly be in because they're such high earners and they're not even aware that they're so addicted to spending and making money, and they get themselves in a hole. Every five to six years, they end up in some type of weird financial hole. And you don't hear about this publicly. This is like private stuff. And then, but what happens is like they panic. They can't believe this has happened to them. They make all this money. But because they're high earners and they're really good at making money, and because they're, you know, a famous actor or a famous basketball player or they're, they're, they're on a, an, in the NFL or they, they own a business. They don't have to be famous. They could just be a successful business owner, right? Because they know how to make money and they have the skills, they just hustle their asses off and they figure out, this is important, this is important. They hustle their asses off and they figure out a way to dig themselves out of that hole. And they do. And they make it out of the hole and then they get back on top again. And what do they do? Okay, everything's okay. They're making all this money. And now they, they start spending money again. And then they do that for another five, six years, and then they end up in another hole. But because they're really good at making money and they have connections and they know how to make money, they hustle their asses off and they get out of the hole. And they literally just keep doing that. And they're not even aware that that's a, an extremely dangerous, risky way to live financially, but they don't know any other way. They're just high earners. So he started talking about, I shouldn't talk anymore. Go to Mike Dillard and buy Richard every day. I'll see you inside. Let me let him know that just I don't want him to get mad at me. Because <laughs> I don't normally say stuff like this. So I'm giving credit where credit's due. Um, because this I can't even give you a fraction, but this is something else that I learned. He talks about how this is powerful. Unless the money that you make is purely passive income, because there's there's earned income, there's passive income there's portfolio income and there's residual income imagine if uh, there's something called like a bus business if you got hit by a bus could you make money tomorrow so why in the why in the hell would you increase your lifestyle if you don't have supplemental passive income if you're 
if you're depending on your lifestyle to be paid by selling your future labor and your future hours of, oh, I could just go out and work my ass off and pressure wash and climb the trees and cut the lawns and do the landscaping and it'll be paid off in 15 years. That's like dumb as shit. You should at least spend that time and energy investing in some type of assets or building your business is the highest ROI you have because it's like the, it's like a, a small stock market is your business. It's, it gives you a higher return of investment that you can make at least make money from it. That doesn't require your own back to do it. So increasing your lifestyle without first increasing your capacity to earn income is a really risky thing to do. So he also talks about, Making 100% of all your bills and living expenses at least be completely passive. What's that number for you? Is it five grand, six grand a month, seven grand, 10 grand a month? Do you have a higher lifestyle request? Requires 20,000 a month. I know mine is like, I'm in Michigan for us to live just like basic, comfortable. It always comes up to like six grand a month in Michigan to pay, you know, gas, phone, electric, mortgage, cable. Life insurance policy. We now uh, open enrollment. We have health insurance um, and all those expenses. Be like, what's six grand a month? Mine is like three grand a month. Well, I'm talking about being able to like go out to eat and have Christmas presents under the tree and like take your dogs to the vet. So I'm like obsessed with this stuff because if you grew up extremely poor and then you finally get a little bit of money. Can you not help yourself? Are you like a kid in a candy store? Are you just running around blowing money and buying shit that you don't need? What's up, Bill Hall? It's interesting how, you know, big house, you want it so bad because you never had it. And then there's people, we in Michigan, I have a bunch of clients in this retirement community. It's called the Glacier Club and it's right off the golf course and they're really nice condos, but they're not like the, I mean, they're really nice, but there were all of the really, really successful high earners and CEOs and people that were like chief engineers and business owners who were able to save up and sell their houses and they liquidate their big, beautiful homes. And now they go buy a house and get Glacier Club. It has an HOA. They don't have to do anything. And then they downsize their life. Their kids are all grown up and have families of their own. And so they get rid of their big ass houses and they downsize, which makes sense for retirement. Now you think of it, but there are also people that move out of their huge house or mini mansion and they go back to a normal house. Cause they're like, that's crazy. Think about how much it costs to like, you know, pay for all that. There is a, a weird, horrible smell in my studio all of a sudden. I really hope that my dog didn't take a dump in my studio because he has before and it's my fault for letting him in here. All right, I'm going to go. It's pretty late. I got to go to bed. I go to bed every night at midnight. I stop everything and go straight to sleep and I can't believe I've been on here this long. Thanks for spending this time with me, guys. Just to recap real quick, Who, Not How. There's a book by Dan Sullivan. There's a book by Dan Sullivan called Who, Not How. Stop asking, how am I going to do this? And say, who can help me do this? Who can I learn from who's already done it? Who can I hire to help me do it? Who are the who's? Stop asking how, because how doesn't get you anywhere. It's like a ethereal, weird question that just freaks you out and pisses you off. Say who, not how. All right, guys, have a good evening.